So it is not a fact that one is helpless and has no choice. However, once we choose, knowingly or unknowingly, <coughs> to act in a particular mode, then we're forced. But before that, we do have a choice. <coughs> and obviously the proof for that is that human beings are responsible for their actions. How can you hold someone responsible if they have no choice? If you decide, if I decide, not to choose, and not to make a choice between one mode and another, but just sort of float along whichever way the winds of the modes happen to blow, that's fine. That's your choice. That is a choice. The choice not to improve and not to change. That's also a choice. We shouldn't think that we don't have a choice. We do have a choice. And how is it that we get that choice? Prabhupada is emphasizing. The duty of the guru is to elevate the disciple by giving instruction that will invoke higher modes. And then it is the choice of the disciple to follow. Maybe he'll follow, maybe he won't. That is the responsibility of his son. This responsible spiritual master. He doesn't, and we'll read about this later, he doesn't automatically elevate someone from the mode of ignorance to the transcendental platform. That requires a highly qualified follower. But generally, spiritual master may give instructions that may elevate a person from lower modes of material nature to higher modes of material nature through the execution of devotional service. But the disciple has to be willing to follow, and that's what really initiation is all about. That one really makes this decision, one is that convinced, both about the process, about the individual, about the relationship, that he follows under all circumstances. So here the conclusion in regards to this point is that one may certainly change, and one may certainly choose to change one's position. How is it that we choose to change our position? Because we see that the result of acting in a certain mode is undesirable. Undesirable for my cultivating spiritual life. And therefore, one chooses to act in another mode, in a better mode, in a higher mode. <coughs> and this choice is really up to us. So this is the vision that is available. The vision to see what are the benefits of the lower mode? Excuse me, what are the benefits of the higher mode, the goodness? And what are the drawbacks uh, of the lower mode? And we should be convinced that we actually do have the opportunity to choose, but we need to empower ourselves. This is sort of modern terminology. How do you empower yourself? Acquire transcendental knowledge. And transcendental knowledge comes from Shastra, it comes from Sadhu, it comes from Guru. But basically it is by that knowledge that we're able to see, discriminate between the favorable and the unfavorable, and then have the willpower to also choose that which is beneficial. So when we do not read, when we do not hear, when we do not study, we should, and we do not associate with sadhus, we should expect that our ability to actually elevate ourselves from a lower position to a higher will be very much impeded. And then we shouldn't be surprised if we say, I've been practicing for so many years, but I'm not getting the result. We're not actually putting ourselves in a position <coughs> where we're empowering ourselves to get the result. So now we can choose. Now the question is, why choose? And we've touched on this. Let's look into it in a little more <coughs> detail. Earlier we've seen, I'm going to stop in about 15 minutes, or a five minute break, I'll write a few things on the board. Earlier we've seen that the modes actually have certain qualities, right? Everyone's got their, their charts, if you don't have charts, some other devotees here do. There's uh, three pages of charts uh, which describe different qualities of things, activities, consciousness, behavior uh, in the three different modes of material nature. This is valuable information uh, whereby if uh, devotees cultivate this vision, they'll be able to, lots of room up front here, they'll be able to see 
how the modes of material nature are at work. The principle there <coughs> is that if we desire a result, then you must simply practice those things that invoke that result. In other words, if I want peace of mind, practice those activities that invoke peace of mind. Simplicity, austerity, cleanliness, and so on. And certain activities. For instance, if I want, uh, if I want to be uh, very fruited, very much inspired, then you engage in the mode of passion. Then you uh, work, uh, you be associated with those people who themselves are very fruited by nature, who want to enjoy the results of their work. Because that result will actually come. Uh, if one wants to be, uh, and we will go through the uh, other point later, the, uh, if, uh, the extension of that is that if one wants to be in a certain mode, then you cultivate those things which are in that mode. In other words, if I want to be in the mode of goodness, then simplicity, austerity, cleanliness, these are the characteristics of the mode of goodness. I practice those modes, as we were discussing. For instance, if I'm performing a sacrifice, if I want to be in the mode of goodness when I perform a sacrifice, then I look at the chart that says, perform sacrifices according to the instruction of Shastra as a matter of duty with desiring no reward. I perform the sacrifice with that mentality, I'm in the mood of goodness. As soon as I perform the sacrifice for some material benefit out of pride, or I disregard Shastra, uh, without distributing prasadam, without chanting Vedic hymns, without dakshin and faith, I'm in the mood of passion and ignorance. It's a choice. It's the choice that we make. So we choose a particular mode, we should simply know what are the characteristics of that mode. And then whether we're doing sacrifice, austerity, charity, renunciation, knowledge, action, work, worker, understanding, so many things, food that we eat, sleeping, drinking, drinking, water, dreaming, you invoke a particular mode. And conversely, if you want a particular result, you just act in an appropriate way, and that result will also come. So one can therefore choose to improve one situation. This gives us a different approach to life. Um, we were discussing this the last time. This is some real uh, management, time planning. This is real spiritual or approaching the spiritual administration management. One actually becomes very proactive in one's life. One has a certain knowledge and we choose what we want to achieve. What is it that we want out of our life? What is it that we want in this world? And what is the activity that will give us that result? When we know the characteristics of the modes of nature, whatever we're doing, we'll know what gives us that result. If we want sense gratification, then you act along the lines of the mode of passion, and you'll get that result. <coughs> but if you want <coughs> transcendence, if you want those things which are conducive to transcendence, then you act along the lines of the mode of goodness. And if you always choose in that direction, you will always begin the mode of goodness. So in this way, our spiritual life becomes very deliberate. We know what the goal is. We know what activities and what direction will bring us towards our goal. So we're being in this way proactive the proactive mode. And what is the proactive mode? It is the mode of knowledge, which is based on seeing. And what is the reactive mode? The modes of material nature are just working, and they're pushing me, and they're inducing me in some way, and I'm just reacting to some impetus. Krishna said, everyone's forced to act by the modes of material nature. You're forced to act. The modes of material nature are active. Uh, those in the mode of passion and ignorance, they simply react. But one who actually has knowledge, 
he can also direct himself as probably <coughs> this stated to choose, no, I don't want to act in this way, I'm forced to act, but I'll, be, I'll act in that way. I'll choose that <coughs> activity which will give me a result beneficial uh, to my goal. So knowing what one's choices are available at every moment, we should make, take responsibility to make the right choice. And in that way, one can actually really live in a very purposeful and deliberate fashion. Because I'm not where I am due to some accident. Well, that's the way things happen. I spaced out this, that. No, I'm choosing. I'm choosing at every moment where I want to be, and I make that appropriate choice. So this 14th chapter describes how the material nature is classified into three categories. Each of them has their own symptoms. Krishna has so clearly explained that. And there's more in the 17th chapter and there's more in the 18th chapter. So Krishna gives conditioned souls a means by which we can interact with the material nature according to the result that you want. What do you want? And whatever you want, here, Krishna is describing how the modes of nature are influencing different things. What result do you want? Then you just act in that particular mode. And you'll get that particular result. So if you want things in the mode of goodness, if you consider that the mode of goodness is conducive, then you make your choices in that mode. If the results that you want are in passion or ignorance, then you choose along that mode, and you'll get that result. The choice is entirely up to us. <coughs> so according to the way we act in the modes, we get that type of result. And obviously, we become entangled in those modes, especially in the lower modes, when we choose to act like that. And as we made earlier, the choice may be either conscious or unconscious. The fact that we just let the modes take us along is just our unconscious choice. We're choosing to live like that. We're not choosing to be proactive in any way. But we see karmis are very proactive. They go to school and university. And why? Because they want what? They want to enjoy the results of their work. They want to be wealthy. And in order to be wealthy, they actually know what the path is. They've not read Bhagavad Gita, but they're taking the uh, choices along the path of passion. They know that foolishness, which means ignorance, lethargy, and sleep, not studying, not referring to any five kinds of codes, morals, will simply be unproductive as far as getting the results that they want. And therefore, they're also very strict. But the fact is that that mode of passion degrades them later to the mode of ignorance. And therefore, even though they may not want it immediately, ultimately, they will end up over it. So, now we should see what is it that is conducive to devotional service. There's two ways. One is, we've seen all the list of the items and the symptoms. So, let's analyze those, and we can analyze them and see what action is preferable for devotional service. See all of the uh, lists that you have. When you're performing sacrifice, austerity, what social order, what, what next life that you want, uh, what's your faith or food or everything. And if you analyze all of these, we, should, we can then see, well, how will these different activities be favorable for our goal in Krishna consciousness? Will the mode of goodness be favorable? Will the mode of passion or acting in the mode of ignorance be favorable? And the other process is you just simply compare the results of the action in each mode, which is more or less a summary of all of those symptoms. So we can make that study. And if we make the study, what will be the conclusion? The conclusion will be is that the mode of goodness is that mode, that choice, which is most conducive for the goal that we want to achieve, which is spiritual life, which is transcendence going back to God and developing love for Krishna. It is the activity most conducive to acting. Here, uh, in the 16th verse, Krishna is saying, by acting in the mode of goodness, one becomes purified. By passion, one is led to distress. By ignorance, results in foolishness. So judging from what result do you want? What's good for spiritual life? Purification, distress, or foolishness? 
obviously purification. Therefore, one must see. Goodness is conducive for spiritual life. How is it that one cultivates uh, goodness? So do we have time? Yes. Now we'll stop. In the 13th chapter of the 11th canto, Krishna makes some very <coughs> good statements. I'll read this once and then maybe I'll read it again, but you can also refer to it if you all have the books as well. Krishna is saying, <coughs> one can strengthen the modes of goodness by cultivating those things that are already situated in goodness. And thus, religious principles arise. Very good statement. He says, you strengthen the mode of goodness. We're seeing, oh, mode of goodness is favorable. Now, how do I enter into that mode of goodness? And what do I do? He says, cultivate those things already situated in goodness. And thus, religious principles will arise. He says, religious principles strengthened by the mode of goodness destroy the influence of passion and ignorance. Yes. We're affected by passion and ignorance. But, if we are strengthening the mode of goodness, especially through the observance of religious principles, then the influence of passion and ignorance on us will diminish. When passion and ignorance are overcome, their original cause, irreligion, is quickly vanquished. Irreligion means kama isha, pura isha. Krishna continues to say, according to the quality of religious scriptures, water, here quality means modes of material nature, one's association with one's children or with people in general, the particular place, the time, activities, birth, meditation, chanting of mantras and purificatory rituals, the modes of nature become differently prominent. In other words, when one is performing all of these activities, he has a choice to do them in different ways. That's given in our charts. There's three ways to engage in three types of religious scriptures. They're also in different modes. Uh, water, association, uh, place, time, activities, birth, meditation. There also are three natures. There are also those of passion, goodness, and ignorance. So Krishna says, according to the qualities of these, whichever one you follow or practice, that mode becomes prominent. Simple. You practice a certain quality, its respective or concomitant mode becomes manifest. Krishna now continues. He says, among the ten items, these were ten items which I'll go into later. He says, among the ten items I have just mentioned, the great sages who understand Vedic knowledge have praised and recommended those that are in the mode of goodness, criticized and rejected those in the mode of ignorance, and shown indifference to those in the mode of passion. So Krishna here started to say, he says, if you want to become uh, situated in goodness, then cultivate those things already situated in goodness. And from that, religious principles will arise. These religious principles uh, will help you strengthen the mode of goodness and that way passion and ignorance will be destroyed. And when passion and ignorance are completely overcome, then the original cause of your religion, Ridrogatama, which is lust within the heart, will quickly become vanquished. He says, but don't be misled because there are other types of <coughs> religious scriptures other than those in the mode of goodness or transcendental. There are those in passion and ignorance. So those for people in the mode of passion and ignorance. And there are so many other items, another nine items, <coughs> which apparently are the same, but they have different qualities because they're infected or affected by the lower modes of material nature. He said, reject ignorance and passion because the wise and sages have only recommended for you to choose those in the mode of goodness. Once again, the issue of choice is here. So Krishna has said this. He's saying, amongst the ten items, the sages praise, recommend, praise and recommend those in the mode of goodness and criticize and reject and show indifference to the mode of passion and ignorance, which means choose the ones in the mode of goodness. So this is, we'll stop here for two minutes, five, three minutes. 
So everyone can consider this thing, that by knowledge, one gets discrimination, you can see the modes of material nature work. One can then analyze which of those modes of material nature are conducive for spiritual life. The symptom of goodness is knowledge and purification. The symptom of passion is suffering and lust. The symptom of ignorance is just foolishness. Obviously one will know that knowledge and purification is that which is conducive for spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Therefore one should practice those things which place us in grace and by knowing places, time, circumstance, etc., which are the characteristics of goodness, then one will choose those instead of choosing a lower nature. In that way one can determine to always be within that mode. Of course it takes practice. But if we have the proper vision through knowledge, which comes through association, we'll be able to see and we'll be able to be empowered to choose. And we can progressively always choose to be in the mode of goodness, which will be the platform for us to actually practice devotional service, which will ultimately bring us to the transcendental platform. So the answer is to why to choose? Because you get the results that you choose. What result do you want? Then you choose. You make your choice, and you will get that which you choose, and you act. All right, a few minutes break, and then we'll continue.